So this video is the last in the How to Practice series, which are short sermons on getting your shit together, musically speaking. We've already looked at how to get your brain back on track, how to fix your posture, find a teacher who isn't a complete jackass, and how to track your practice in order to maximize your results. This video is going to focus on the nuts and bolts of actually getting down to business and practicing. We're going to stray a little bit into the what to practice, but I'm going to try and not be too prescriptive because my musical goals will differ from yours and I don't know what you're working on. So the best thing to do is to take the concepts um, that I outline, if you think they might be useful to you, and apply them to your own musical situation. The first item on the list is carving out your own physical space to practice in. Now, this is going to be difficult depending on your living arrangements, um, but often I find that our musical lives get shoehorned into two square foot between the wardrobe and the bed or your basically has to live under the kitchen table wherever um, and that presents a physical barrier to practice if you have to always get your gear out and sort of move everything else around you waste practice time and it's really helpful i find to have a space that's just purely dedicated for music no matter how small or large that is it's good to have a space in your home or wherever that you know is just for playing and nothing else I find that really helpful. I'm very fortunate to have got to the point where I'm able to rent a studio space and dedicate that to nothing else but music. Um, I spent a lot of the last decade practicing in the corner of bedrooms or renting garages or lockups and things like that, trying to squeeze in the practice time wherever possible. Um, but it's really nice to have that mental and physical separation from home life and try and carve out that work-life balance and make sure that you have space for relaxing, space for everything else, for living your life, and then a separate area for practice. Related to the idea of having your own physical space to practice in is having things set up in such a way that you minimize any physical obstacles to practice. I try not to practice at home ever, but if I have to, then the process of having to unpack amps, etc., cables, plug everything in, get everything set up, and that takes five minutes. That's wasted five minutes of practice time and the effort of doing that often leads me to not do the practice that I need to do. So ways around that, I try and keep my base on a stand or a wall hanger wherever possible. So it's always within reach and it's always ready to go. Second thing, I don't use an amp to practice at home. I have a little Vox uh, amp plug headphone amp, which is not amazing sounding. It's not Tone City, but it allows me to quickly get a sound and it means that I can practice in a very small area and not disturb other people. It has an aux cable so I can run any tracks that I need to learn or I can put a metronome in there as well. Uh, it just means that I can get to doing the work as soon as possible without that physical barrier of having to unpack everything and set it up and then pack away at the end of a practice session. Point number two is something that I've banged on a lot about in a previous video called Your Brain is Rotten and lots of blog posts are about this and that is avoiding distractions and making sure that you can focus properly when you get to practicing so you can maximize your practice time because let's face it we're all pushed for time none of us have enough time to practice so we need to make the most of it one of the ways to do that is turn your phone off put it on flight mode put it on silent whatever don't check things um, don't have the tv on in the background don't try and practice while you're watching tv a lot of people go oh i like to practice technique while i'm watching tv studies have shown that if you do that if you try and learn things while watching tv it goes to the information goes to the wrong place in your brain <laughs> it doesn't quite get stored correctly also if you're really practicing something it should require your full concentration otherwise you're just playing things that you can already play quite well and there's absolutely no point in doing that one of the most fundamental elements of designing a practice schedule that often gets overlooked is establishing the difference between practicing and just playing so what is practice practicing is trying to get things that you can't do into your comfort zone practicing things that you don't have complete control over that you are not competent with and getting to the point where you can incorporate them into your playing playing is just as it sounds applying the things that you've been working on in the real world so if you've learned a lick let's say you're learning a new lick or a you know, you've been studying a scale, whatever. In the practice room, you get the, the fundamental elements of those things together, practicing slowly, making sure you're familiar with all the notes, any fretboard uh, patterns of fingerings, things like that. Then applying that over a backing track or preferably with a real person 
in a sort of jam situation, that comes into the playing. So practicing is learning the nuts and bolts of a, of a technique or a harmonic or melodic idea, and then playing is putting it into context. Now, in order to be an effective musician, you need to be able to do both. The pr one of the problems with the sort of age of information that we live in now is anyone can get onto YouTube and just access any amount of information about any given musical concept. And that quite often leads to what gets termed paralysis by analysis, this sort of information overload where every day you get on YouTube and you look for a new lesson and you're just taking in information constantly, but you're never taking the time to master any of the concepts that you learn about. So what happens is you end up understanding things very well on an intellectual or theoretical level, but you lack the practical application. You can't put that into context on a gig, on a jam session, whatever. So one of the typical things are sort of what I term higher order harmonic concepts like tritone substitution or the big one at the moment that's uh, getting people very excited on YouTube is negative harmony. I see a lot of people getting very excited and touching themselves over Jacob Colley videos because negative harmony is now the hip thing. And that's really epic. But if you can't play basic lines over 251, if you don't know where your chord tones are, you have this very little point, I think, in getting into negative harmony just because it's the most new and exciting thing. And it's important to strike a balance between practicing and playing because if all you do is practice, then you learn lots and lots of new things, but you never get to apply them in the real world, so they don't really become part of your playing. It's like learning lots of long, complicated, expensive-sounding words, but then not actually understanding how to use them in a sentence or put them into a conversation. They're largely redundant. If all you do is play, then you never really learn anything new because you just trot out the same licks over and over again. So you need a balance between learning new information and then actually putting it into practice. So let's say that you have an hour to practice. How do you divide up that time in the most effective way in order to maximize your progress? So here's a thing that I got from a clinic that I went to many years ago with Todd Johnson. Um, and one of the things he was talking about was this idea of what I call chunking, which is breaking practice time down into small increments focusing very deeply and then taking short breaks between them. So the time period that he recommends is 15 minutes of focused work and then a two or three minute break. You might find, depending on how your concentration levels are, that you might be able to go for slightly longer. Personally, I like, don't like to go for more than 20 minutes at a stretch. I feel like I get burnt out after that. So let's imagine that you have four things to be working on. Now, I've said that I don't want to be too prescriptive and tell you what to practice because chances are we've never met I've never heard you play um, I don't want to just make sweeping generalizations about what people want to be working on but in my experience there are things that most bass players neglect and there are things that everyone can do with improving on a regular basis so let's look at how we chunk our practice time effectively So we're going to have four topics, let's call them A, B, C and D. And we're going to practice each of those for 15 minutes. In between those we're going to take three minute breaks. Now on the subject of breaks, a three minute break easily turns into a five minute break which turns into 10 minutes which turns into 22 minutes. You get the idea. So it's pretty easy to get off track and distracted by something else that needs doing. So what I like to do is be horribly OCD and put a timer on for the three minute break. So it means that whatever I go and do, I like to try and get up and move around a bit um, and generally not think about music for three minutes, go and have a cup of tea, whatever. It's important that when that timer goes off, I'm straight back to work and I don't waste the time that I have available. So let's think about four topics that most people need to work on. This is based on my experience as a teacher over the last decade and just as a bass player who's trying to be less mediocre. So here are some things that most people need to work on. Let's call the first one fretboard knowledge. Broadly speaking, you only need two areas of expertise in order to be a really great bass player. The first is knowing the notes that go into chords and the second is knowing where those notes are on your fretboard. And most musicians, most guitarists and bass players fall down 
on one of those areas, if not both. Either they don't know the notes that really go into, into chords, all types of chords in every key, or they don't know where those notes are on their fretboard or both. So fretboard noise is a really important thing to work on. I'm not going to tell you how to do that. You need to work that out for yourself. Uh, the second one then, chord tones, there we go. So 15 minutes on fretboard knowledge, take a little break. Another 15 minutes on chord tones, little break. Uh, let's say sight reading. Obviously I run a bass transcription website, so I'm pretty biased towards being able to read. Then the last one, repertoire. Why is repertoire important? Well, if you don't know any tunes, then it's really tough to do a gig. So we've got four areas of 15 minutes with three minute breaks in between. So the benefits of chunking for me are that A, it helps me fit more in in a given day because I'm not burning myself out practicing anything for too long. It means I can fit more chunks uh, into a given practice schedule without feeling overloaded. And B, it helps me retain information better from day to day, again, because I'm not overloading myself with information.